We are here today to talk about President Biden's fiscal year 2024 budget request and fiscal year 2025 advance appropriations budget request for the Department of Veterans Affairs with Secretary McDonough. As we work to assess our nation's needs for the year ahead and return to regular order and pass bipartisan funding bills in a timely manner, we have a very serious obligation to make sure we provide for the men and women who fought and sacrificed to keep our country safe and their families. No one has put their life on the line for our country, should struggle to provide for their family, put a roof over their head, pursue a higher education and good paying job, or get the health care they need. And upholding our promises to our veterans isn't just critical to our country. It is really personal to me. My dad was a veteran. He fought in World War II. He was awarded a Purple Heart. And after he was diagnosed with MS, which eventually made it impossible for him to work, he was able to get the care he needed thanks to his VA benefits. Knowing how important that care was to my family is part of why, in college, I chose to intern at the Seattle Veterans Hospital. And working there, I saw firsthand the challenges that our veterans were dealing with, the physical and mental wounds. I have never forgotten what VA support meant for my dad, and I've never forgotten what it meant for the veterans at that hospital. And that's why I'm always listening to veterans back in Washington State about the challenges they are facing, fighting to get their families the support they need, the support they deserve, and working to make sure we keep our promises to our veterans. That has been a priority of mine since my first day in the Senate, from my time serving as the first woman ever to lead the Veterans Affairs Committee, to helping establish and then expand the VA Caregivers Program, to working in a bipartisan way just last year to pass the PACT Act. And it will continue to be my priority as I lead the Appropriations Committee. And this important subcommittee with Ranking Mem Member Bozeman, who I know also cares very deeply about our veterans. When it comes to our veterans, we cannot cut corners, we can't break our promises, and we can't let partisan politics get in the way of passing the funding the VA needs. Let's be clear, anything other than a regular appropriations process will have negative impacts across the VA and will hurt veterans back in our states who need to get their claims processed, benefit from medical and prosthetic research, and get care related to their toxic exposure. Bottom line, if we fail to fund the VA and in a timely way, it is our nation's veterans who pay the price. We absolutely cannot let that happen, which is why today's hearing is so important. And I'm pleased to say President Biden's budget shows he also understands that when we make a promise to our veterans, our word has to be ironclad. For starters, this budget once again considers VA medical care accounts medical care accounts separately from the rest of the non-defense discretionary budget. This is an important step to make sure that in delivering the care our veterans need, we are never forced to raid other essential programs that help them pursue an education or buy a house or start a business and so much more. And it when it comes to VA's overall funding level, I'm pleased to see this budget proposes a 5% increase across mandatory and discretionary accounts from the funding we provided in FY23. It includes a proposal to expand child care sites at VA facilities to ensure that lack of affordable child care is not a barrier for veterans who are seeking care. And it includes much needed increases for veterans suicide prevention, homelessness prevention, gender-specific care, women, by the way, are the fastest growing demographic of veterans, and for the caregivers program, which I am pushing to strengthen. President Biden's budget also includes funding for structural needs, like improving VA infrastructure and implementing the PACT Act, the largest expansion of veterans' care in decades. And this is so important. Every single member of this committee voted to pass the PACT Act because we know veterans who are exposed to toxins in the line of duty deserve care. The bill we passed last year has the potential to make life better for many people in Washington State and across the country, but only if we make sure it is implemented to its full potential. And that means we have to provide funding and accountability. Of course, the PACT Act was signed into law after the Department's request for discretionary funding for fiscal year 2024 was submitted. So this budget accounts for that by moving some dollars meant for this work into the Toxic Exposures Fund, which did not exist when the funds were originally requested. And it puts forward a methodology and an estimate for the costs of providing this expanded care. These are important steps 
but next VA must develop a system to collect data and track actual demand related to toxic exposures and revise and strengthen their methodology going forward as they've done for the mission and choice expansions. I look forward to discussing this and the administration's request for the Toxic Exposures Fund and working in a bipartisan way to make sure VA has what it needs here. I also expect to hear more about VA's electronic health record system. As you know, the rollout at VA sites at Washington State has been an ongoing disaster with new disruptions still happening. I've heard from providers who are burnt out trying to navigate this broken interface patients who were unable to get medicine they rely on because of system malfunctions, and even a patient who received a late cancer diagnosis because of flaws in the system. And that's just we, what we know right now. It is unacceptable. I've been saying for quite some time now that VA should halt future rollouts in Washington State and focus on fixing the program where it already exists, like in Spokane and Walla Walla. So the Department's reset announcement last week to do just that was certainly a sentiment that I agree with. But I still want to know more about how exactly the Department is planning to get things on track, including by negotiating stronger performance incentives and penalties in a new contract. I hope this reset means real results. But in the meantime, I'll continue work, working with my colleagues to pass legislation that implements the kind of aggressive oversight needed to fix the current EHR system so these kinds of failures, failures never occur again. Mr. Secretary, I look forward to hearing more from you about those issues and working with everyone on this committee to make sure we are providing the funding and the accountability our veterans deserve. Because this just isn't just funding for these families. These are not just programs and contracts to them. It's whether they get the benefits they need to make ends meet, whether they get the prescriptions and mental health care and more they need to stay healthy, and whether they get that cancer screening and start treatment early. In other words, it's often literally life and death. The stakes are so high for these families, whom we owe so much. And as chair of this sub subcommittee and as the, a daughter of a veteran, I will do everything we can to live up to that obligation. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Ranking Member Bozeman.